I'm just going to spend a few minutes here talking through some of the um, high-level uh, security requirements uh, from the TEFCA, uh, specifically from the Common Agreement and some of the supporting SOPs. Um, you know, I do have some slides. It's not my intent to go through the slides line by line and bore you all to death. Um, but there are some things towards the end um, that I really want to get to. So I might skip through some of the, the early material a little bit quickly um, to allow some more time for question and answer discussion um, from you all and from some of the other folks in the room who contributed to a lot of this material as well. So I'm Jonathan Coleman. Um, I am the CISO uh, for the RCE, uh, supporting the TEFCA program through Sequoia. All right, so as far as the agenda for today goes, I'm not gonna go through, again, all of these line by line, but I would like to just highlight at a very high level how security has been baked into every single one of those TEFCA components. Um, in particular, um, some elements of the common agreement um, I've summarized a little bit here, um, and I think it's important to, to remind folks um, that um, these security provisions uh, apply to QHINs, uh, but in some cases they also apply to the participants and sub-participants. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And um, finally, the part that I really want to get to is the draft SOP that was recently published um, that has some additional security requirements, um, not just for QHINs, but also for participants and sub-participants. Um, and we're, we're um, looking forward to receiving some comment on that uh, before that SOP is actually finalized. So here is the high-level diagram I'm sure you've all seen many times uh, with the different components of TEFCA. And across the top in this big block arrow, um, we've just sort of overlaid some highlighted areas of how TEFCA considers security within each one of those components. Um, so certainly the Trusted Exchange Framework or the TEF, um, you know, there are some principles there and security is one of them. I'll throw that up on the screen. The common agreement itself, um, really the... Um, the, the, the foundational document that drives all of the other security requirements for QHINs participants and sub-participants stems from that. Um, then we do have the standard operating procedures, and we have a number of security-related SOPs um, that deal with different aspects of oper operationalizing uh, those uh, requirements that are outlined in the common agreement. So they're the things that I'm gonna focus on for the most part this morning or this afternoon. So here is a, a straight cut and paste from, from the TEF itself. And just as a reminder, principle four is there, privacy, security, and safety. And within that, you can see that um, principle four focuses on how health information networks should exchange digital health information in a manner that supports privacy, data confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and promotes patient safety. And the collection of SOPs that we have and those requirements and those slowdown clauses in the common agreement are designed to achieve just that. So here are some of the elements from the common agreement and these are just summarized. So if you want to see the exact language and um, you know, the, the, the legal aspects of, of how they're written, please refer to the common agreement. Um, but in general, the HIPAA security rule applies to all of the participants, sub-participants, and QHINs, regardless of whether or not they are um, a business associate or a covered entity. And I think that's really important. Um, when I say generally speaking, and the, the legal folks and Lindsay and others can, can help us with this, um, obviously there are certain elements of, of the HIPAA regulation that wouldn't apply, um, but in terms of the standards and the safeguards, that need to be put in place um, that is written into the common agreement and those elements uh, are required. There's a cybersecurity coverage SOP and for those of you who are um, with candidate QHINs and are going through that process, uh, you'll be very familiar with that one. Um, cybersecurity certification. This is one that I will drill down into in a little bit more detail. Um, cybersecurity certification applies to the QHINs. We're not requiring participants and sub-participants sub-participants to be certified, um, but the QHINs are. And so whether you're a QHIN, a participant, or a sub-participant, I think it's important to know um, the level of rigor that is being asked of the QHINs, um, and we will dive into that. In addition to the certification, um, QHINs 
uh, will have to go through uh, an annual technical audit or an annual security review and provide evidence of that to the RCE. Um, and then there are other flow down requirements uh, in the common agreement that relate to certain exchange purposes like IAS and so on. When Tefka is fully operationalized and live and data is flowing, we will have a cybersecurity council. And that cybersecurity council will be part of the governance structure for Tefka and will um, be um, constituted of um, CISOs from the QHINs, uh, as well as participants and um, advisory groups uh, as well. And to me, this is the part that is really going to um, have immediate influence and ongoing influence on the overall security posture of the entire framework. Because the input that we're going to get from the CISOs, who are QHINs, and the participants and sub-participants, as appropriate, we can share best practices. We can, we can talk about what will be the most impactful. We can develop guidance, and we can share that among the entire community. So that's the part that I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I think you know the SOPs and everything else that we're developing right now are absolutely um, essential. Um, but this is where uh, the real world implications uh, are going to be factored into how we run things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some other requirements that are included here, TEPCA security incident notifications. Um, the common agreement has some um, uh, requirements for um, vertical reporting. Um, you know, there's some pretty comprehensive language in there about uh, when an incident has been, uh, you know, identified, uh, how that must be reported to, um, you know, upstream participants and downstream participants and sub-participants. Um, we will further uh, articulate exactly what should be reported and in what manner uh, in subsequent um, documents and SOPs. Um, but it's important to note that in terms of individual notification for um, notifying individuals that their information may have been affected, um, that nothing changes the way that that should be done today with respect to HIPAA or, or state law. All right, so I'm going to dive in now a little bit into the security certification process um, that the QHINs are, are going through. And we have an SOP for that. Um, and the SOP has a number of discrete elements that we'll go through um, in a little bit more detail right now. So to start off with, every QHIN must be certified under a nationally recognized certification framework. Um, and right now we have a uh, High Trust, um, the High Trust R2 validated assessment is, is the first. Um, we have uh, set up a website um, that, that lists them and lists that certification because they have others, but the R2 um, validated assessment is the one that we're, that we're accepting right now. Um, and we do anticipate that you know, in, in time there may be others that come forward um, and some organizations have uh, made some suggestions, and, and as, a, as other suggestions come forward, we'll continue to evaluate them. Um, but right now, this is the framework that we're, that we're looking for. Um, some elements of the uh, cybersecurity um, certification process that are important here. Uh, NIST 800-171 is written in as a mandatory uh, scope for that assessment. So we have had um, and do have QHINs or candidate QHINs um, that are in various stages of their high trust assessments. Um, some of those QHINs uh, are already high trust certified um, and may or may not have included, um, for example, NIST 800-171 um, you know, as part of their initial certification program. Um, and that's okay. And uh, you know, as the applications come in, we'll continue to work with the applicants on how that can be addressed, either through a supplementary assessment, an interim assessment, um, or, or various other means. And um, I know that the folks from High Trust are, um, should be here somewhere, I can't see, they're in the back corner waving. Uh, so Michael and Ryan um, are available for questions too, if you have any questions specifically about the High Trust certification program and the process itself. But as far as our needs go, uh, we do need to make sure that NIST 800-171 is included, um, and um, 
if it's not part of the existing certification cycle because of whatever um, you know, degree of um, progress you've made so far, uh, you may have started or be already HITRES certified and not previously included that in your scope. We will work with you to make sure that that is incorporated. The HIPAA security risk analysis, um, consistent with that security assessment that is required under the HIPAA security rule. So as I said at the beginning, you know, we, we are taking security very seriously and we do recognize that the HIPAA security rule is pretty much the de facto baseline standard minimum level for, for healthcare security in the United States. Um, we also understand that there may be um, organizations or entities participating in the ecosystem who are not business associates or covered entities. That doesn't matter for us. We are expecting everybody to um, meet the requirements and the implementation specifications and safeguards of the HIPAA security rule. And as that relates to QHINs who are applying uh, you know, candidate QHINs who are applying to be, to be designated. Um, this is, I think, an important part of the certification and part of their, as we'll get to in a second, the annual review. So as far as the annual review goes, those things that we just talked about in the application still stand. Um, also, a comprehensive internet penetration, uh, internet facing penetration test is required. Um, and that needs to be done by a, a third party organization, um, not something that we expect to do in house and, and you know, grade our own homework on. Um, and um, also an internal vulnerability assessment. And so that's different from the internet facing penetration test. This is a way for organizations to take a look at their technical infrastructure, their processes, their procedures, um, and how all of that works together um, to help identify um, organizational vulnerabilities and technical vulnerabilities within the internal infrastructure and operations of that entity. Um, so patch management might be an example there, um, or you know, the way that you might do uh, you know, background checks or, or security awareness and training for your employees. So this is the part that I was looking forward to getting to. So we have a draft SOP um, that has been recently published which has additional security requirements for QHINs, participants, and sub-participants. Um, some of the content of this SOP, and it's, it's, it's not a very long SOP, um, were elements that were previously published in one of the early drafts of TEFCA, uh, the minimum required terms and conditions um, that was part of the, you know, the early day evolution. Um, and that stuff was, um, not included in the common agreement at the time um, that the common agreement was published with the understanding that it would be incorporated into uh, SOPs which are you know, more uh, readily um, usable by the implementer community. And so the things that we're looking for um, really in this particular SOP, authentication, audit, and secure channel. So some of these elements are already described and documented in the QTF. And the QTF focuses, for the most part, on the QHIN to QHIN transactions and the QHIN to participant transactions. This SOP essentially takes some of those same standards and extends them to the, the participant to sub-participant uh, exchanges as well. Um, this SOP doesn't cover everything, and you know, we've got a slide at the end that lists some of the other SOPs that also contain some security requirements that may be applicable to you, depending on you know, the use cases that you're implementing or will be implementing. So let's start with authentication. Um, we have a definition down here of workforce uh, that, was, uh, that was taken uh, and, and modified um, from regulation, it was modified just to suit our needs. Um, and uh, essentially what we're asking for here is that workforce members who have access to CEFCA information um, or PHI, if they're a business associate or a covered entity, be authenticated at AAL2. And for those of you who don't know what that means, if you've ever had to sign in to your you know, PayPal account or get a one-time password through your phone, those are examples of how um, you know, two-factor or multi-factor authentication can be implemented. Um, 
and the idea here is that um, both individuals and workforce members uh, who are giving folks who might be volunteers at the, at the registration desk access to information systems be properly authenticated, right? So that we don't have um, that gap in traceability between the system events that occur and the actual um, you know, provision of those accounts that, that made those transactions. So again, this is open for comment. We welcome your feedback. We welcome your discussion. Um, please do provide feedback because we know that um, you know, not all of these approaches might be implemented in your organizations today. And if you think this is a terrible idea, we want to hear about it. If you think that it's just not going to be possible, we want to hear it. If it's something you're already doing and this is a no-brainer, we'd like to hear that too. So as far as audit goes, um, it's important from, and, and this was mentioned in some of the earlier panels uh, today as well, uh, it's an important from a traceability and accountability standpoint to be able to know what's going on within the networks. Um, we understand that there are a number of different standards that are out there that describe how auditing is done, uh, IHE Aetna, this ASTM standard, and so on. And what we're trying to achieve here is a requirement for entities to be able to make sufficient audit log entries of the security events within their, within their systems so that if there's a problem, um, you know, we have the ability to uh, help troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. And if that's a security incident, uh, you know, that becomes especially important as well. What we don't want to do is tell you how to run your networks and tell you how to run your organizations. So what we're really looking for is a way for organizations to have a set of auditable security events that must be captured and must be protected. And this AMSTM standard, um, we think, goes a long way to, to providing that. Secure channel, um, this sounds obvious, and hopefully it is, um, but we are requiring um, that the, uh, the, the internet-facing communication paths that happen between QHIN's participants and now through this to sub-participants uh, utilize TLS 1.2 uh, with BCP so that we can make sure that insecure cipher suites um, are not used, uh, that the, the ability for some of these um, handshaking activities with the protocols when the sessions are established can't roll back to earlier insecure versions of TLS. Right, because that's just, that ship sailed and there, there are too many um, obvious vulnerabilities associated with those. So I think that brings me to the end of the discussion on um, the proposed new requirements. Um, I promised you a resource slide. So we do have the SOP for QHIM cybersecurity coverage that I mentioned earlier. Um, the security requirements for the protection of TEFCA information that is the version that was revised to incorporate um, the third-party security certification requirements and some of the underlying details that go along with what that should look like. Obviously, the QTF, um, the QHIN technical trust requirements for those who are interested in um, you know, how certificates are going to be deployed. Um, the two websites that we have listed there are the QHIN cybersecurity certification website, and that is the one that's currently uh, with the high trust R2 validated assessment. Um, and that list will be iterated on as more uh, frameworks or, or certification models come forward. Uh, and similarly, uh, the credential service provider approval organizations, and that links to those organizations within the Kantara um, organizations that are, that are approved CSP organizations. Um, I just mentioned the draft SOP, and um, we do have, and I mentioned this earlier, um, some additional requirements for uh, IIS providers that are articulated both in the common agreement and um, in part also in the SOP. Um, and we will have uh, another SOP um, published in due course uh, regarding incident reporting and other security incidents. So I'm gonna stop there and um, like to direct any questions you may have to my panel who are scattered around the room. <laughs> C 
seeing as the panel is a little bit sparse, I guess I'll put this to you. <laughs> Stephanie Counts with ICF. Two questions for you. With regard to the breach notification, could you speak a little bit more to indemnification provisions between participants? And if that's a question for the lawyers in the room, could you maybe spend a little bit of time discussing the um, internal network vulnerability assessment? What's the scope of that? As you think about payers, they are in fact um, families of brands. What is the kind of the fence that goes around that scope? Yeah, so I can't speak to the first one. That, that is, I, I thought I saw Lindsay. Um, yeah, so that, that's definitely not one that I, I, I feel comfortable taking on. So thank you for understanding that. Um, as far as the scope of the vulnerability assessment, um, it's difficult to, to talk to that in abstract because every organization is different, every topology is different, and, and the way that organizations are using third-party vendors and have dependencies on you know, cloud service providers and software as a service, it makes it different to how it used to be done traditionally. And the way I, I would answer that is sort of in part related to the first part of your question. If there were to be a security incident and you feel that you would be responsible for um, providing the notification to the affected parties, then that would be, you know, within the, the, whatever the root cause of that was, would be within the scope for your vulnerability assessment. So if you're looking at um, your network infrastructure and you have third parties that are providing you with a service, you should hold those third parties accountable for what it is that they're providing to you. And I think that it's fair for an organization to say, I need to understand my risk, and while you're providing this service to me, it's not just the supply chain risk. I need to know what the actual um, processes are that, that that organization is going about to identify, identify vulnerabilities and to mitigate them and to manage those on an ongoing basis. Um, so I don't think it's um, necessarily good practice to um, completely delegate the vulnerability management to a vendor, um, but to try and incorporate that vendor um, within your vulnerability assessment um, to, the, you know, to the extent that you can. I don't know if that's really exactly what you're looking for, but you know, it's everything that's inside the firewall as opposed to looking in from the outside. Thank you. I think I saw a hand up over here. So. Can we get you a microphone real quick? Sorry, so the others can hear you too. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So who, who sets the uh, cybersecurity insurance requirements and who determines adequacy? And is that included in the certifying entities review or is that somewhere else? It's in the SOP. And the, the requirements for coverage are in the SOP and they're in the common agreement. And um, that is not part of the third party um, security certification process. But who, who's, who's determining what is adequate? Well, I think that that's been a policy decision that's been made between, you know, Sequoia and ONC and others. So um, I, I don't know who came up with the number. If there are questions about the number or you have feedback on the number, you know, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. My question, if there's somebody in the room who knows, that would be great, is less about what the number is than, than uh, how, how, whether what they did for accounting for different kinds of risk uh, and whether that varies by type of organization or whether it's a one size fits all. I'm just kind of curious about the process to development and how they develop that. Yeah, I don't know. Alan, do you have a comment on that? Would you like to? I, well, no, I wouldn't like to. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for doing it anyway. <laughs> I mean, largely it was, it was, as you said, Jonathan, discussion and, and a lot of work back and forth between the RCE team and ONC and leveraging uh, what we know exist in existing uh, uh, networks and, and national frameworks for their limitations on liability and cyber insurance requirements, uh, taking that and, and coming to a, a decision. I mean, all of that was part of the original common agreement, so it also went through a lot of uh, 
uh, stakeholder feedback and then public industry feedback before those numbers were finalized in the common agreement. And then those numbers are replicated over into the cybersecurity SOP uh, for some of the additional pieces there. But it's all in the common agreement and so went through a whole lot of process to come to agreement on those numbers. Thanks, Alan. All right, that sounds like that's a wrap. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.